Good evening, my friends. This is the Grim Flayer. Hope you're all doing well tonight, and I hope you're ready for your anatomy lesson. That's right, we're talking about the anatomy of a planeswalker. This is a design theory video wherein I intend to explore why Oko's design, in my opinion, was so terrible and so warping and eventually resulted in multiple bans, and why Liliana of the Veil's design is completely amazing. It is the absolute gold standard for what a planeswalker should be. They don't have to be these safe, boring ones that all follow the same template and therefore aren't really strong enough to see play. Liliana is a very pushed card. She is very, very strong. She's a staple of every format she's legal in, but she generates genuinely fair gameplay, whereas Oko, technically nothing he's doing is unfair. Uh, everything he's doing is nominally fair. He is a nominally fair card, but he warped almost every format around him to the point where he's gotten banned once per month in every format so far um, that has kind of been overrun by his presence. So we're going to explore the nuts and bolts of that, the whys and the wherefores, and let's, uh, let's get right into it. Okay, so I'm going to tell you the crux of my theory at the beginning, and then we're going to go through a few different examples as to why. They, as I say, they're both nominally fair cards, but they generate fair interactive gameplay in two very different ways. Oko Thief of Crowns is a resource generator. He is oriented toward generating value in a positive way. He creates a food token. He turns food tokens or other low-cost artifacts into elk. And he also interacts with the opponent by elking the opponent's board. But even when he does that, he has contributed... Uh, he, he has made the board resource neutral, right? He has decreased the quality of the opposing board, but he is not depleting resources in any way. He is generating resources on his side of the board, and even sometimes on the opponent's side of the board. Now, Liliana of the Veil is the exact opposite. Liliana of the Veil is oriented toward resource depletion. When she ticks up, both players lose a card. When she ticks down, one player loses a creature, and when she ultimates, the opposing player loses half of their permanence. So this is really what it all hinges upon. Resource generation versus resource depletion. Now let's talk about a few examples as to why. So the first place that distinction manifests itself is before the game even begins. It is in deck building. We've got Gilded Goose and Arkham's Astrolabe as two of the most egregious recent examples of cards that have just disgustingly powerful synergy with Oko. Gilded Goose is a mana dork that makes a food. So Gilded Goose, of course, would allow you to power Oko out ahead of Curve on turn two, and any threat that generates repeated value, whether it be resource advantage, resource depletion, or any other, you know, some kind of attack, some kind of a repeated damage, anything like that that gets your repeated value, the earlier the better, right? The earlier the better. So the fact that these mana dorks play so well with Oko is very, very dangerous and made him even more egregious than he was. But the only reason these cards are good with Oko is because he is committed to resource generation. So the goose comes down, makes you a food, gets you your Oko out on turn two, and then the Oko can turn the otherwise, you know, mostly too low quality to see modern play zero two flyer that can be a monosync to make food tokens into a three three elk that's really ahead of rate like a really proactive threat that attacks and blocks and protects oko and eventually teams up with a bunch of other elk in the herd to close out the game right arkham's astrolabe another great example this um helps you hit your land drops to ensure that oko comes out at least on curve if not sooner and of course helps you fix your mana for oko all while can tripping and if that wasn't good enough again mere one mana after getting you all of the above Oko can tick up to make it an elk so those are the types of deck building synergies that a resource generating planeswalker naturally gravitates toward liliana of the veil can you think of much more oppressive and modern especially now that oko's banned than liliana on turn two i can't i mean that's just incredible especially on the play you're either edicting your opponent's turn one play 
and then forcing them to somehow rebuild their board while also dealing with your Liliana, all on two mana, or you are starting the attrition game nice and early. So imagine if Gilded Goose was playable or another mana dork, let's say Birds of Paradise or Llanowar Elves was playable alongside Liliana. Well, it would almost be better for you to have spent a card on your turn one dork to then power her out on turn two if you plan on going on the plus one plan, right? Because the sooner you get hellbent, the sooner you dump out your hand, the better. So the dork enabled that and enabled her early, and the dork will also enable you to keep dumping out the hand to make Liliana's plus one asymmetrical as soon as possible. That sounds really good, right? So how come nobody does it? How come nobody plays mana dorks in their Liliana of the Veil deck? Well, that would be because Liliana's resource depletion strategy demands that you have a critical mass of powerful, swingy, value-oriented, game-ending top decks, and Gilded Goose, Llanowar Elves, Birds of Paradise, all the rest, they do not qualify. So Liliana's resource depletion means that her deck-building considerations, um, as far as those go, she is kind of self regulating. You can't play the mana dorks, you can't cheat her out ahead of curve. Nobody plays like Simeon Spirit Guides alongside Liliana either. It's just not the thing to do, whereas Oko can turn dorks into elks. He can turn mana rocks into elks. He can turn cantripping mana filtering snow artifacts into elks. He can turn everything into an elk, so there is no reason not to abuse him even more by getting him out ahead of curve and that's one reason why the depletion versus generation distinction is so important to understanding why one card is busted and the other one is fair. So next up, let's talk about their abilities, my friends. Oko in the resource generation category has an unconditional plus two. We also have a high starting loyalty. So this is kind of a red flag combination of resource generation plus high starting loyalty relative to CMC. And the fact that Oko has two ways to tick up, I know this isn't revelatory. I know this isn't like a breaking, you know, a hot take or anything. Everyone knows that his he's unbalanced partially because he has two plus abilities. But look, if we look a little bit deeper, the plus two resource generation is always unconditional. So there is never any circumstance that's going to come up except in real corner case scenarios where you don't want to at least plus two, make a free food, food token, go to six. Also the plus one, very, very likely that you have a good target for it, especially given the aforementioned deck building considerations. But even if you don't, elking the opponent's board is often live, or maybe just upgrading one of your creatures or artifacts, basically always live. Worst case scenario, it becomes live next turn after you make a food token. You later, of course, turn it into an elk. So this is a one-man army. This is resource generation cranked up to a completely absurd level. There is almost no restrictions on it. There is almost never any way in which in which you are punished for trying to do it. And there's uh, it was so homogenizing that there was basically nothing better to do in even in modern than this because it's just always universally good in just about any situation. And then of course the minus five is also kind of, it's, it's a resource neutral, like you're not creating new resources, but you're also not taking away new resources on the battlefield. You are just, uh, again, Oko is all about resource generation. So the longer Oko sticks around, the more resources accrue and accumulate on the field. And that means that you're kind of in the spot, especially if you're on an opposing fair deck where you feel obligated to play it out against the Oko because... Technically, your deck does provide the ability to outvalue, you know, the one elk per turn or the other things Oko is up to, especially if the Oko player bricks a little bit, you know, you can climb out of it. But Oko generates a sense, and not just a sense, like a mathematical reality of inevitability, because no matter what, no matter what, an unchecked Oko is getting serious value. And yes, that's kind of how Planeswalkers operate in general, but Oko really took that to the next level, and I think that's all wrapped up in how centered around resource generation he is. Now for the polar opposite, we look at Lily of the Veil, vale, the resource depletion queen, and we have the plus one that is symmetrical. 
You know how often if you play a league with a Liliana of the Veil deck, you're agonizing over which card to discard to your own ability? Like, this is the type of decision-making that most Planeswalkers just simply don't demand of their controller. In fact, Liliana of the Veil is the only Planeswalker that sees regular modern play that you will, on a regular basis, see her controller decline to activate her. You know, it's their turn, they've got priority, they didn't forget to do it, they're just choosing not to. And that is why her design is so brilliant, because if when I put it that way, it sounds like she's just bad, but clearly she's not. She's one of the top five most powerful Planeswalkers ever printed. She's a staple in every format she's legal in, basically. It's just that she has the resource depletion orientation, and that really, really changes the math. Oko, it's inevitable. He just inevitably snowballs the game in a very boring, very repetitive, very homogenized way. Liliana of the Veil games with an unchecked Lily, they can go in a million different directions, and that's very exciting gameplay. Um, the number two is balanced as well. It is one of the only outs that any deck in the format, really, but especially the decks that tend to play her, have to hexproof, indestructible, um, you know, protection, blah, 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 those types of effects that stymie interact action. But at the same time, if you are if you find her a little bit too late and your opponent's just going wide, her minus two is very, very underwhelming. Liliana's minus two also, of course, can target yourself. There are corner case situations where that matters. Nobody is saying a three mana edict effect is broken, especially one that targets and is stopped by Leyline of Sanctity. But all things considered, Liliana is a real puzzle. You can play her 12 games and you will have 12 different use cases for her. She will give rise to a dozen different textures um, of games. And of course, that depends on what's going on around her in your hand, in, on your board, on the opposing board, etc. But Oko, you know, yeah, it's just kind of all the same. Everything's an elk. Oko runs away with the game. His loyalty gets into the double digits. He's got a million food. There's just no way you get through that. Liliana, very, very different. Even Liliana's ultimate is very unique in that it doesn't end the game. Like, it can be very crippling, obviously, but probably the board is already empty if she's allowed to just take up to her ultimate. So you're usually just getting a multiple stone rain effect. And yes, that can be a huge setback against control, big mana, even sometimes mid-range, which is, again, why she's very good. But the game goes on, right? In most cases, the game really does go on. And her alt is skill testing and decision intensive for both players. So we see that resource depletion leads to a much wider variety of scenarios in which the same type of game, the same matchup can play out. Whereas Oko, if you stick the Oko and he's uncontested, unless the opponent's doing some kind of a combo that totally ignores the board, totally ignores Oko, and is unable to be elked into oblivion, yeah, Oko pretty much makes the game an Oko game, and that's that. One other thing briefly worth mentioning, guys, and this borders on more personal preference, but I don't think I'll be alone in this. I mentioned the build-arounds with Oko, the free roll synergy inclusions like Goose and Astrolabe and all the rest. With Oko on the field, you're already incentivized to play those things in your deck, where, of course, again, as with Liliana, you're not. And when Oko sticks, he's just making more and more and more of them. More elk, more food, more all the rest. And he's also not removing the opponent's creatures, he's turning them into elk too. Whereas if Liliana sticks, she's ripping apart both players' hands, getting both players hellbent. She's edicting the opposing board. So what this results in... And again, this is where preference kicks in a little bit, but Oko gives rise to these really unesthetic, like, super cluttered board states where it's all chaos, but it's all homogenized at the same time. It's all kind of boring, everything's an elk, but it's super cluttered, and with Liliana, the board is clean. Liliana keeps your board clean. If you're a minimalist, you gotta love that about Liliana. Maybe if you're a hoarder or something, you like that about Oko. But another kind of important difference in terms of how people enjoy the game, I think, so one that might be a little bit less obvious. Let me know what you think about that. All right, guys, example time, scenario time. So let's say you're the Liliana of the Veil vale player, you're on Jund, you're on Rock, whatever. You are against blue-white control. The blue-white control player is on five lands, 
including a celestial colonnade, and their board is empty, and they're totally hellbent. You, the Liliana of the Veil player, are at four loyalty, also hellbent, also uh, empty boarded besides Liliana. You draw Assassin's Trophy for turn. So this is a super, super interesting decision point. One of the options is, of course, you just trophy the colonnade and take Liliana up. And that's all well and good, and there's definitely nothing wrong with that. That's the more proactive thing to do. That's making them have it, right? But it's not a free roll decision, and here is why. You are still two turns away from ultimating the Liliana. And you are against a deck that on average out top decks you. So you are giving the opponent a two turn window to find something like a Jace the Mind Sculptor, a Teferi Hero of Dominaria. These cards can both absolutely bury the Liliana player and force and actually punish the Jundar Rock player for attritioning so aggressively early on with Liliana's plus one. So there are some incentives to hold the Liliana, to hold the Assassin's Trophy rather, and not activate the Liliana, because you can then, in theory, win through a top deck Jace or a Teferi before they bury you and not be dependent on top decking an answer when you just threw one away. Finally, against blue-white control, another consideration is that, again, if you all if you tick your Liliana up too aggressively while you're hellbent, let's say the scenario has changed, the opponent has one unknown card in hand, obviously that could be a monoleak. That could be a path to exile. That could be something that is dead unless you pr unless you play something out that turns it on. So of course you'd want to tick up with Liliana to get cards like that out of their hand, but what if it's a cryptic command? Cryptic command in response to a hellbent Liliana player plus oneing her, cryptic command can of course tap, or excuse me, not tap, they bounce Liliana and they draw a card. So especially if they have multiple cards in hand, that is a way to start rebuilding from the Liliana, but whether or not they're able to do that, they are at least able to bounce the Liliana before her own ability resolves, she will then be discarded to her own ability. So at every turn with Liliana, you have not only very impactful and important decisions to make in respect to your own cards, like if you draw a trophy. Um, trophy is actually one of maybe the worst examples I could have chosen, because at least you can always fire the trophy off on something and then take Liliana up. What if you draw like Abrupt Decay? What if you draw, you know, something um, some, something else in a different matchup, like a Decay or a Push that could be really high value, things like this. And Oko Thief of Crowns, I'm not going to say there are not decisions involved with him. There are some complicated board states. There are some things like this that yeah, especially in Oko Mirrors, again, with all the clutter, it gets really, really complicated. But with Liliana, you have to wonder, how can this activation hurt me? And with Oko, it's basically always like, yeah, which is the best of my few very good options. So in other words, Oko is much more forgiving of mistakes, because even if you take the suboptimal line, you still did something good. You still got the free value, got the repeated value. Again. Whereas Liliana of the Veil, it's like, one misstep can really be fatal. You play into that cryptic command by plus wanting too aggressively, you get blown out, the blue-white player out top decks you, and that's the game, you know? You too cavalierly spend the Assassin's Trophy, you lose to the top deck Teferi. That's game. You know what I mean? So Liliana, definitely much much more interesting, again, in terms of how her abilities and the deck building strategies that naturally rise up around her manifest in game. Whereas with Oko, no matter what you're doing, Oko's kind of good with it, and it's kind of a free roll to do something with Oko. It's just going to be good. All right, guys, so I don't want to make this video too long. I could go on. I had another couple ideas, but you get the picture. Resource generation versus resource depletion. This is the fundamental philosophical schism between these two cards. And yes, you could say that, well, Oko would be balanced if his plus one was a minus two or something like that, or if he just had much lower loyalty and only got plus one for max of any of his abilities, things like this. I don't know. I mean, yes, certainly he would be more balanced, but I still think that the template of resource generation, un mostly unconditional resource generation, especially that is so flexible 
and doubles as a removal is fundamentally flawed. And I, in general, think they are way too cavalier with pushing Planeswalkers. I think Ren and Six is a little bit too pushed for my own tastes as well. Even though I've been playing Jund now and I will continue in the future, obviously I love casting him. Obviously he's really sick with Liliana of the Veil. Talk about some deck building synergy. But I think they should really tone it down with the Planeswalkers in general. But... If we want to push the design space of Planeswalkers, or indeed of threats in general, we need to realize why Liliana of the Veil vale is so powerful, so pushed, but so fair, and never going to get banned, and almost certainly never going to be a part of anything that gets banned, unless they unban Deathrite Shaman maybe and have to reban it again. Because again, the play patterns and deck building synergies that she mandates, they just don't operate that way. They just are not going to break modern, but they can keep modern's most broken strategies in check. So there you go, guys. That's my take. But of course, there's a lot more that we could have talked about if we wanted to go even more in depth. And there's probably some things I didn't think about. So if you agree, if you disagree, you can always share that in the comments. I think these are interesting intellectual exercises, and I hope you feel the same. Hope you enjoyed it, and uh, stay tuned to the channel because this type of theory and analysis is, you know, these things percolate around in my mind, and increasingly I'm likely to put them into video form in some way but of course lots of gameplay to coming down the pipeline modern jund modern prowess mono black aggro and pioneer and donation leagues as well so i will see you for all that and i will see you in the comment section hope everybody out there has a wonderful night